Here's a look at a generic fanless mini PC which I got from AliExpress. This particular one has a Core i7-6500U mobile processor in it and that has Intel HD 520 graphics. I got this as a bare bones unit and I've put a 250GB Samsung SSD in it and 16GB of crucial TDR3L memory. It has an all aluminium case and it provides heat sinking for the processor. On the front we have a power button, a SD card reader, a USB 2 port and on the back we have four USB 3 ports, analog audio, a Bluetooth and Wi-Fi antenna, display port, HDMI and 12 volts DC input. Now one thing to know about this display port is that it is not dual mode. Uh, so if you want to attach this to a HDMI or DVI display, you'll need a true active adapter. The uh, cheaper cables which only level shift, uh, they will not work. The particular adapter I'm using is this pluggable one. You also get this vertical stand and I generally use this. Here's the box unit came in. The picture in the front is of a slightly different model. And on the back, you can see the different uh, case options, this being one I have. Now actually, this computer is not the one I originally wanted. The original one I wanted uh, had this style case, uh, but it did not have um, a VGA and an HDMI. It had two HDMI. It also had a Core i5-5257U processor with Intel Iris 6100 graphics. Unfortunately, when I went to buy this, uh, I found that despite all the AliExpress sellers showing as having that particular model in stock, none of them did because they couldn't get hold of the uh, CPU anymore. And frustratingly, they would leave their listings as being in stock. And when I went to purchase them, I would get an email saying, sorry, it's not in stock. And I would have to go through the refund process and uh, generally wasted a fair amount of time. However, uh, eGlobal, which is the uh, particular seller I bought this from, after having a discussion with them, they let me know that there was a new model coming out which had HDMI and DisplayPort, because all the uh, other ones which were available only had uh, VGA and HDMI. I don't see the point in having VGA analog connection in 2016, no use to me, so I wanted two digital outputs. So the one I've got is alright, uh, the case form factor is not what I wanted, it doesn't have as many USB ports as the one I wanted has, and it also doesn't have the Iris graphics. Although really it probably doesn't make much difference because it's a newer Skylake processor and it's an i7. Certainly in my extensive testing it's doing everything that I want it to do. Uh, its main job was to be completely silent and to replace a Core 2 quad machine which I've had for a very long time and it's very noisy and just had to go. My old PC also had an NVIDIA GTX 260 graphics card in it, and that draws more power than this whole PC does. Also, I found the 3D performance of this new PC to be as good as, if not better, than that old graphics card. So, included in the box, you get a couple of antennas, that's for your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. You also get a Kingston USB stick, 16GB, which has been branded by the, uh, the, the seller. Uh, it contains drivers for graphics and chipsets and such like. You also get a flat style HDMI lead, warranty card and a 12 volt 5 amp power supply. The quality of this, well, it remains to be seen. I've not cracked it open and time will tell if it blows up. This uses the 3 pin cloverleaf laptop style connector. One negative point I do have to bring up is the mains cable which came with this power supply. It's absolutely terrible. It's very thin and uh, I was able to snap it very easily. As you can see there's just not very much to this at all. Um, it's very uh, flexible and thin and uh, just by standing on this at one end and giving it a modest tug it just snapped. I also got this um, UK style but a completely non-compliant plug. In the UK they use ring mains and those require fuses to be in the plugs and this of course does not have a fuse. Of course I have loads of other cables lying around so it's not too big a deal. This is the underside of the unit. There are six screws around the outside and this bottom plate comes off. You can attach a 2.5 inch uh, drive to the bottom and I've chosen to do that and put a standard Samsung SSD in. There's also uh, MSATA on board if you want to use one of those. Okay, with the screws out we should be able to flip this over and there's the SSD. One thing I forgot to mention was you also get the SATA cable and the SATA power cable. This plugs into the small header on the motherboard. The SATA cable is the locking type. As you can see there's actually quite a lot of room in this case. Uh, 
it's definitely more of an industrial use case than the one I was looking at before, which had a bit more style and was clearly aimed more at home use. On the other hand, it does provide lots of room to add any other bits of hardware or do any modifications that you might want to do. The only real modification I have done as such is just with the power LED here. Next to the power button is a blue LED indicator, or at least it should be. However, actually, the LEDs are surrounding the button and nowhere near this hole. So to get around that, I've just stuck a couple of white pads to bounce the light uh, out that hole. And that's effective enough, it's not too bright, um, but I can tell it's actually on. The power button and light assembly attach into a header here. There's also the front USB and SD card reader, and that plugs into a USB header here. There's a free USB header here which isn't used on this current case. Here's two SATA ports, but you only get the one SATA power port here. And here's your RAM slots. Here's the mini PCI Express wireless card. This does both the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. I'll cover the specifics of what that particular card is a bit later on. And flipping it around, you can see the headers over here. Uh, this is the USB one that's currently being used for the card reader and the USB port in the front. There's another USB one there, and that's for audio. This has the Realtek ALC892 chip. Standard CMOS battery there. Uh, most of the stuff up here is power supply circuitry. Uh, you can also see the uh, display port connector here. This unpopulated space here, I suspect, is for VGA because I can see that there uh, is silkscreen markings for VGA. Uh, it says VGA1 there, and I suspect if there's a VGA port, that'd be populated. We've got some unused COM port, uh, serial port uh, headers here. Mm, do those work? No idea. We also have unpopulated fan connectors here. There's an internal EDP uh, display port here, if you wanted to drive a panel in some application that was using this motherboard. And for those wondering, this appears to be the motherboard model number. I can find absolutely no information about this online whatsoever. And by the looks of it, it's been very recently tested. This is the RAM I have installed, 16 gigabytes in total. It will take faster, however, this was the RAM I had when I was in Denny to get the older model. And here's your mSATA connector if you want to use that for an SSD, and perhaps also install a 2.5 inch hard drive for extra storage. Signs of thermal grease being used, which is a good thing. I'm not going to take this board out, curious as I am, because everything's functioning and I don't want to mess it up. Okay, I'll put this back together and we can have a look at the very comprehensive BIOS setup and I'll also boot into the operating system and show some games and other pieces of software running just to see how it performs. Alright, let's go ahead and power it up and go into the BIOS setup. Delete key for that. So here we go, uh, here's the AMI BIOS uh, setup. Now, this BIOS seems to be very comprehensive. It's as if it is basically very generic and hasn't been particularly well customized for this particular board and therefore just has everything possible in it. Uh, so we'll have a quick look through it. There's a lot of things in here but um, I'll just try and be as brief as I can. So here's the main page which is very typical, it tells you information about the processor, the memory installed and you can set the uh, language and the time. We're too advanced and we have everything from trusted computing to ACPI settings to overclocking which I've not even looked at yet. Um, many options which I've not even looked at. CPU configuration, I've pretty much left everything at the default. Um, I've not really messed with the uh, the CPU settings in here too much. There are various thermal options which you can adjust in here and both in another screen. There are many options I've not even explored or looked up to see what they actually do. Uh, we have options, for example, setting various voltage levels, uh, camera types, which is particularly interesting, Here's your SATA configuration. Looks like I've got it plugged into port 1 instead of port 0, despite it being marked the other way around on the motherboard. Thermal configuration, here we go. So, the thermal configuration, you might want to do some tweaking in here. I have messed with these values a bit, but to be honest, I have never seen the processor go above 65 degrees, so none of this has been an uh, issue. USB configuration, I've not had a need to touch this, it's doing everything I need. There's plenty of chipset options to play with, including interesting things like Skycam device. I've not actually looked into what that is referring to in particular. Uh, graphic settings. I have tweaked the memory settings a bit. Whether they're making much difference, I don't know. I've not done a proper test to see uh, what effect these values actually have on real-world performance. Various memory configuration options. Again, I've left everything at default. And continuing, we have everything for PCI Express configuration. Again, I've left that as default. More USB options, biosecurity options, HD audio configuration. This is slightly interesting. You can enable 
DSP options, and there's various other quite low-level settings for setting buffer voltages and other things. And this is also quite interesting as well. Serial I.O., plenty of options in here. I've not touched these. I'm intrigued about these uh, I squared C buses, uh, whether these are available on the board somewhere or if they are actually attached to particular devices already. Uh, same with these UARTs and GPIO. I've not had to look at these. Skycam configuration. Here's this Skycam thing again. I, I've tried to figure out precisely what this is referring to, uh, and yep, I can find no information. More thermal throttling options, including for the uh, SATA controller. Now looking in here I can see uh, this referring to SATA RAID ROM. Hmm, I'm wondering if that unpopulated space on the board was perhaps for a RAID controller and various onboard devices configuration, including the onboard LAN controller and whether you want to enable wake on LAN and other options such as that. Typical security options, typical boot options, and that's about your lot. Uh, there's far more things to see in various sub-menus, but this would be a very long video if I went into each one and actually uh, did some research on what each of the options do. So, if they're important to you, well, you can look up these things yourself. Okay, so let's come out of here and let Windows boot. Okay, here we are, booted into Windows. I use Dell 2007FP 1600x1200 monitors uh, in a dual configuration. I've only just got uh, the one output at the moment because I'm using... Uh, the monitor on display port and the HDMI capture device is plugged into the HDMI port. Here's some CPU core temperature information. As you can see, at the moment it's pretty low because the computer is not really doing much. I can see this going up to about 65 degrees or so if I'm, for example, encoding video and software. For the specifics of the CPU, you're probably best looking up the uh, model and looking at the specifications for it. And of course, as you can see, it's the Intel HD Graphics 520 and I've currently got 1GB of memory allocated. I'm rather intrigued at this uh, showing as an engineering sample. Hmm. So I suppose the main question is, is this computer fast enough for what I need it for? Yep, it absolutely is. And that's basically all that matters. The main tasks I need it for are web browsing, general system administration, video editing, video capture, playing music, watching videos, all that stuff, and occasional gaming. But the games I play are pretty old, and therefore the graphics performance is not too important. So because it was really cheap, I downloaded Battlefield 4 just to see how it runs, and to be honest, for my standards it runs absolutely fine, so let's have a look at that. Now I'm running this in uh, cloned, um, cloned monitor mode, so there, there might be some um, frame rate artifacts uh, as a result. This game I am no expert in. The uh, the last uh, Battlefield game I I uh, really played seriously was Battlefield 1942, and that is quite a long time ago. Oh well, I didn't last too long. Uh, but as you can see, it's, well, it seems playable. So, here we are in Team Fortress Classic, a game which is uh, very old, but I still play. And to me, this running properly is uh, far more important than Battlefield, which uh, I know is going to seem crazy to uh, most people watching this, but, um, well, just the way it is. Of course, I'm getting full 60 frames per second with VSync on, you wouldn't expect anything less. Uh, this game will comparatively run on a potato. God, I might even get a flag cap in here. So, there we go. Um, of course, Team Fortress 2 and other uh, Source games run brilliantly as well. Um, you know, I've had no problems with frame rates, and though they remain solid at 60, 60 FPS as well. Uh, but they're also they're also old. So, um, yep, if you're a fan of playing old games, this PC will certainly do. And uh, if you're wanting to play some modern games, then you know it will manage at uh, lower resolutions. It will manage. Um, 
the absolute latest games, I'm pretty sure it won't, but, um, you know, um, something like Battlefield 4 and stuff like that seems to be, uh, seems to be playable, and uh, for me that's quite alright. So I've had this a few weeks now, and it now lives behind my monitor, and has been performing absolutely fine. I have my USB Focusrite uh, audio interface connected, and if I'm honest, this is the only problem I've really encountered with this, and it appears to be some kind of issue with the Skylake USB under Windows 8.1. Um, I've had some occasional issues, however, since moving this into a USB 2 port, uh, it seems okay, but I'll have to monitor that situation. I've also added an Anchor USB 3 hub to the setup. One thing I forgot to mention previously was the fact that there's an internal LED in the motherboard, and it's pretty bright. With the light off you can see that it shines out pretty brightly and will light up the nearby wall. Uh, this is also true of the yellow uh, LED on the Ethernet socket. I also contacted the seller about the fact that it has an engineering sample Intel processor inside, and the response was that it was a mistake and it should have been a production one and it was soldered on accidentally. So, mm, whether you believe that or not, I'll leave that to you. However, it's certainly something which shouldn't be happening, although I have heard plenty of stories of things like this happening before. So, it's reasonably cheap, it's certainly cheerful, and for the most part, does what it says on the tin. However, just be aware that these devices do not have the support that the big name brands do, despite the fact that it comes with a warranty. I suspect you'll probably have a harder time dealing with the manufacturer on this one. Anyway, I hope this somewhat rambling video has been useful to someone, and I'll be sure to post any updates if there's any further developments.